Okay. Okay. Good. So good morning. We resume with yesterday's lecture. I start with uh, task recursion that I introduced yesterday. So what we want to do is to establish some bijections between different sets of maps. And we will do as follows. So we consider maps, for example, like this one. So the marked, the first marked phase will be this one. And here we have another phase that is internal, for example, we will consider different cases. And this one belongs to the set of maps of genus G and boundaries and fixed lengths of the boundaries given by L1, Ln. What we want to do is we want to remove the first edge of the first boundary and establish bijections with all the possibilities that we get. So this is the first boundary. And it has length L1. Okay. So in this case, for example, this one is a, um, an internal phase of uh, length J. So it's a Jagon. And we want to see what happens when we remove the edge. So we just get here, this doesn't change. And we just get a larger first boundary. Okay, so we have removed the marked edge, but we still want to keep the boundary. So we, ha we have to mark it somewhere else. So we just mark it in the next one. So there is a canonical way of marking. And this uh, just has one less jagon. And uh, first boundary now has length L1 plus J minus two, okay? So it has a uh, same length L1 plus J, but we have removed this one that was counted uh, twice, so minus two. Okay, and now we have to translate this type of things to the generating series. So this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna see all the possibilities that we get on that side. And we're gonna establish these uh, bijections that give us the recursion that we want. So, okay. So these uh, type of maps are counted by the generating series that we introduced yesterday. Generating series of maps of genus G with boundary lengths given by L1, Ln. And then we have to, uh, on the other side, but I will just subtract it because I will put it on the same side. We have to put the contribution coming from this type of maps. So it will just be um, maps with the first boundary of length L1 plus J minus two. The rest of the lengths are the same. And then we have lost a jagon, so we have to add it. And the jagon can be of length from one to uh, D. Remember we had bounded the jagons um, by, by this uh, length. Okay. So now we want to apply the operator. So I want to give you directly because otherwise this takes a very long time to write. I want to give you directly the recursion on the Ws. Remember the Ws were this generating series, but collecting all the lengths together. So I want to apply this operator that I will call O that just takes our generating series with a fixed, with fixed length and sums over all possible lengths. And this will produce for us the correlators. And uh, well, for some uh, technical reasons, it will be a bit better. I will just multiply by X1 as well. So what this gives us, the first uh, term uh, with this operator is exactly X1, W, G, N, X1, Xn. So remember uh, these variables take care of the length of the boundaries and we just multiply by this one because we multiply here. 
as simple as that. And then this one will produce two terms for us. So the first one is the one that uh, you might be thinking of. Um, it's just the same WGN X1, Xn. But we have to multiply by this because uh, we have uh, this shifted length here. And we also have to multiply by the TJ, okay? But the problem with this is that here we have added too many things. So we also have to subtract something that will be a polynomial in X1. So, okay, why is this? It's because uh, this length, uh, this new length, is bigger or equal than j. And this is not what we are putting here. In here, we are considering L that starts at, uh, at zero. Um, so we have to subtract those extra terms. But remember that j is bounded by d. So that's why this guy is a polynomial in, uh, in x1. OK, so it will be bounded. So polynomial. And actually, I will tell you exactly what uh, the, the expression is, even if we don't need it too much. Um, yes, maybe I should remember what V was. So V was the potential of our matrix model. And we were just taking this. Um, yes. Okay, so with that, we can write these two first terms as V prime X1 times the correlator. And then with this uh, new name, you can observe that this is just Ah, yes, yes, sorry, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Otherwise, that is uh, very confusing. Okay, so here I want to take just the positive powers of X1, of this guy over here. So this just does for you what I described combinatorially. So. Okay. Now let's see another possibility because this is not the only thing that can happen. We can also have something that looks similar but will give a very different contribution. Yes, yes. Yes, so we are taking all the maps in here, all the possible maps in, in, in here that contribute to this um, generating series. And we are subtracting the first edge and see what we get. And we will get different sets that are like smaller in some sense, either the topology will, will be smaller or something will be smaller. And they will be contributing to these pieces. But now uh, I will write the equality and it will be equal to something else that is the rest of the maps that we can get. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, writing it like this because otherwise I have to write many times and move the things to the other side, but it's uh, a bit confusing, but you will see it in the end very clearly. So just to be clear here, there will be the equality already. So, okay, I want to see the contribution coming from a similar guy. But this time, I want this one to be the first boundary of length one. So boundary one of uh, length one, L1. And this one will be boundary two. So imagine it's uh, marked like this. And not boundary two, sorry, boundary I of any length Li. Maybe let me denote it like this. And of course, i is different from one. So in this case, 
and you have some genus here, you get uh, Wait, sorry. You get just this. Uh, you mark the next one. Am I marking properly? No, because I want to be. <laughs> so remember that my convention for marking is that the boundary has to be on the left. So I should be marking like this. But uh, there is a convention to mark here. So it's the same there. Sorry. I want to keep the same boundary, so it has to be like this. So it's on the left. Okay. Okay, so now this one uh, will have a boundary one. Is it uh, one? Yes. Boundary one will have length L1 plus Li minus two. So it's uh, very similar to before, but the, the difference is that this one is a boundary instead of a jagon. So it will give a very different contribution. And uh, I will give you directly the answer in the correlators, but this one is not so easy to see that it gives directly this. So I will give it as a small exercise to complete the details if you haven't done this computation before, otherwise you will, you will know how to do it. So now here we subtract the boundary J, this is what this means. And you can observe that here I'm already reducing something. So the, the ends are smaller here. And on the, in the previous one, I was reducing the number of jagons, if you want. Okay. Yes. So um, very good. So we uh, forget the first edge of the first boundary. We mark the next one. That, uh, that we find, so it's uh, this one. So it, it may be, well, you, you could say that it's this one, but then it would be a bit unnatural. Uh, but okay, there is, a, you choose either the, the previous one and you have to write it, uh, mark it correctly or the next one. And uh, you forget the other marking. So, okay, this is important. Forget the marking of BJ. Okay, so this will come, and this, uh, this you should be seeing, from uh, a guy in which we choose which one to mark, the ith one. And then it will be a map with the first length of, uh, the first boundary of length L1 plus Li minus two. And then the rest will be the same, except the fact that now we don't have a boundary Li. So, okay, this comes exactly from this type of guys. Then we apply the operator O. And what I'm leaving as an exercise, if you haven't done this computation, is to check this equality because it's uh, not so easy to see. But uh, yeah, it takes a bit of uh, time. And then uh, once you've done it once, you know how to do it for the rest of your life. Hopefully, maybe you have to do it a couple of times <laughs> to remember. Okay, so I will still have terms. So please don't think that the equality is over. Um, we still have some possibilities, right? So we still have these uh, very interesting cases in which we start with genus G. Then the marked one is this one. The first boundary is all this. Then this guy has topology G. So this has N boundaries of lengths L1 and uh, big L, which is a uh, set L2, Ln. Then we remove it. Okay, and now there is a canonical way of marking the next, uh, so this new uh, two boundaries that come from the old, the old one. 
So uh, we take uh, some convention again. So for example, we have to mark, I, I tried to do it the same I was doing. The next one, so, sorry, it's the next one, but it should be marked properly. It should have chosen the other convention maybe. And uh, yes, and then here, uh, am I doing it correctly? Because now I want the previous one, so I should be doing this one. Yes, okay. And then this guy has one less genus. This is very important. And one more boundary. And now the new boundary, uh, the new first boundary has a uh, length J. Okay, some J. And the next one that will be this one will have a length L1 minus, two, minus J minus two. And the rest is the same. Okay, and this gives us, I give it, I give you directly the correlator, but this one is quite easy to see that this is what it should give. So I will not even write uh, before applying the operator O. Then we have one last term that maybe you can guess. That will come from guys like this. So here we have some uh, topology D. Here we have a set of uh, markings for the, for the boundaries. See, the other one. And then we start from N boundaries as before, length one, uh, L1, L. And then we arrive to this. So it's the, same case as before, but we get something disconnected. Oh, sorry, and I'm forgetting all the markings. I should do the same as before. Uh, yes, this one. And then I should put the same genus because I'm not changing anything about the rest. So this is still I, J, and this guy has uh, N plus one boundaries. Now of length j, uh, same as before, L1 minus j minus two and L. And now this guy will have, uh, so n plus one boundaries in total, but we have, get, we have gotten something disconnected. So this piece, this connected piece will have, um, this connected component will have one plus um, cardinality of i. And this one will have one plus cardinal, cardinality of J boundaries. Okay. So I will write the contribution while you check uh, that you are fine with everything. And now you should be seeing maybe that there are no other possibilities. So, okay, I plus J, uh, I uh, union J uh, is the rest of the um, marked boundaries. So it's, uh, they form together the, the variables X2, XN that mark the rest of the boundaries that are not the first one. And uh, X uh, makes reference to the first one and I should call it X1 because that's what I've been doing in the whole equation. So this, uh, we, this amounts for the first piece, this for the second piece. And we need this sum because we need all the possibilities to split the topology, the genus and the number of boundaries.
Okay, so is this equation clear? Yes. Yes, it's included in the sum. Yes, good question because uh, we will treat them separately later. So, okay, now we want to see what happens for the topology of the disks because, yes? Sorry? Yes? Of cutting out a pair of pens. Ah, of cutting out a pair of pens. No. No. Um, you will see how this relates to cutting pair of pens later because, okay. so, okay, if you want a bit of a spoiler of what will happen because you already know something about topological recursion, these will be the two terms that will come out uh, in the topological recursion. So you will see them as cutting out a pair of pens, but this is not what I'm doing now. What I'm doing now is just removing the first edge and establishing the bisection. So you get all these terms. Is it possible? Is there like a big picture idea of what is happening? Like what drives this recursion? Because I, I got a little lost in the details. I mean, I, I think I... Yes, so I can uh, give the, the idea again, maybe. So in the first term, we have all the possible maps in our set MGN. So we fix the topology GN and we fix the length L1, LN. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, so that's for the F, L1, LN, G. Then we sum over all lengths and we get the first term. And now we want to see if we take all these possible maps and we remove the first uh, edge of the first boundary, we want to see all the possibilities that we get. And we get some graphs that are smaller in the number of edges, at least, because we are removing one edge. And we get different things. So we get a contribution that is a mysterious polynomial, if you want. We get some things that have uh, maybe smaller topology, but also some things that have the same topology. So we have things that have less edges, one less edge. And uh, they are given by these different generating series. So this is just a classical thing in combinatorics. Actually, Tat did it in the 60s to count disks. So he only did this for the planar case. And with that, he could compute the generating series of uh, disks. So that was his goal, to compute the generating series of disks. And he thought, OK, I can use this combinatorial trick of removing one edge, find a recursion. And since the first uh, terms with few edges, I will be able to, to see what they are. I will be able to maybe find my generating series. And this is what we are doing now for all topologies at the same time. And now our goal is to reduce many, many terms, use some uh, complex geometry tricks, and get our topological recursion formula out of these combinatorics. But until now, I only use this uh, combinatorial idea. OK, so you promised an equal sign a little bit earlier. Is it? Is it? Yes. Are we still waiting? OK. It's there. It's there. OK. Yes. <laughs> so. You, I was telling that uh, you take the first term in which you have all the possible maps. Then I've been showing that each term is one of the possibilities. So the first two terms come from the first picture, and then it's equal to the rest of the terms. And it, that's, is, uh, that's is there an easy way to motivate why there's that equality? Yes, the, the motivation is uh, exactly this, uh, this combinatorial idea that you can establish a bijection between, so if you want, I maybe can write it here. So we established a bijection between M, G, N, L1, Ln, mm -hmm. and sets um, after removing the first edge of uh, the first boundary. So I took all the possible uh, graphs here. This is the all the pictures on the left. 
Then all these arrows tell me what happens after removing a first ad. So should I think of that as sort of a map from the disjoint unit of all MG and Ls to the disjoint unit of all MG and Ls? Is that what sets is? Yes. Okay. Yes. I've done it uh, at the level of, uh, you don't need to take the disjoint unit. I've done it at the level of uh, fixing L1, LN. And then right. I've summed over all L1, LN. But then on the right hand side, you will get a bunch of different discrete invariants, right? On the right, on the right hand side. Yes, exactly. You, exactly. Okay. Yes. Okay. If you want, I can write, I could write it explicitly. I could write for yeah. you equal mm -hmm. and yeah. every M that I've given. That's okay. But yeah, uh, yeah, you, yeah. Can, you can imagine what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, no. Right. I, okay. Thank, thank you. That really helped. Thanks. Yeah. You're welcome. Uh, yes, yeah, thank you for the questions. It's, uh, it's, uh, the, the point is that uh, you all get the idea, so it's, it's good if something is not clear <laughs> that you stop me and I go a bit uh, slower. So, okay, but now um, that uh, hopefully we are all in the same page, we want to see what happens for disks. This is what Tats did. So for disks, We just get a very easy polynomial. You can uh, start checking which are the terms that are going to survive for disks. So we get from here, since we only have disks, so disks, I mean that in the first term, remember that the first term is that the one that contains everything before removing, uh, we just uh, get uh, a zero one. So this will give us the term, uh, maybe I will write it here just because it's more beautiful, but comes from that first term. So I just wrote the first two terms to the right-hand side. Then this guy over here, will only have one possibility because we only have disks now. So it will just be disks to the square. And then the other thing that survives the only other thing that survives is uh, p01 of x. And then this is equal to zero. This is exactly that recursion for gn equal to zero one. Okay. So this is already nice because this is telling us that the generating series of disks, that was this uh, thing that I um, defined as a formal series, is actually algebraic in x. This is the first thing that it tells us. Then if we have a way to compute the P01, we will have a way to compute disks. So, okay, we can try the naive thing. We can just try to solve the equation. But now this guy over here, the discriminant, will have um, some zeros. So it actually the degree of uh, this guy is 2d minus two. So this will have 2d minus two zeros. And actually, uh, maybe you could already see this uh, from the definition, but Omega zero one was uh, well defined around infinity. And now we can analytically continue it to the whole plane, except some cuts that will have to do with this discriminant. Otherwise it's multivalued. Okay, here maybe it's uh, not so important if you don't get all the details because I don't have time to prove everything. But I will give you a bit the idea because this is the type of things that you need to, to understand to get all the details. So, okay, you have infinity here. Your generating series is well-defined around the infinity. And then um, what you can get from here is that you can analytically continue, but there will be some cuts, okay? So what we can do is uh, define a Riemann surface.
that is just given by the zeros of this polynomial. And well, maybe we need to compactify as well. We just project to X. And this uh, gives us uh, a, a Riemann surface. Okay. This is a general fact. Every time you a general fact. Every time you have a, a two meromorphic uh, functions, they satisfy a polynomial relation, and you can define a Riemann surface like that. But okay, yeah, this is a bit uh, going to the general theory that I'm still not explaining. But the remark is that if you have d minus one cuts, that is our case, then the genus of this Riemann surface will be smaller or equal than d minus two. So, okay, just a very simple picture to, to imagine what I'm saying. But then uh, you will have to believe the lemma that tells you how many cuts we actually have. So if we have three cuts, then the genus can be at most two. This is uh, what I'm saying here. But what happens for maps is actually um, very good. So the combinatorial problem imposes for us that we will actually only have one cut. And this is uh, often called in physics, the one cut assumption, but it's a quite bad name because we don't want to make assumptions. We want to prove everything. So it's not really an assumption. It's just something that you can prove from the combinatorial problem. And I will skip the details because it's a bit ugly to, to prove this, but this you can find in many places, for example, in uh, an house book. So it's ca called uh, Brown's lemma sometimes in combinatorics or one cut lemma. And well, some uh, matrix models in physics were solved making the one cut assumption. So sometimes it was, uh, Difficult to prove, people didn't prove it and just assume it from maybe checking some things. So what we see is that actually this guy is of the shape that I said, but most of the zeros will be double and only two zeros will be odd. And okay, we have some expressions for these uh, zeros. In terms of two generating series on the variables that keep track of the um, uh, interior faces. So these two guys are actually just series in the T1, Td. So they are complicated guys, but uh, you can compute them uh, in particular cases. And unfortunately, maybe I will not have uh, time to give a, a particular example, but you uh, may see it in uh, Sevan's talk on Friday. So, okay, from this, we get that our generating series has genus zero. And then we know that it exists a rational parameterization. So, okay. In this case, it's very nice what happens. You can find, uh, so this is the, the X plane. And remember that our function is multi-value there. So there is this uh, cut. But we can actually find the reparameterization that opens the cut. Okay, so what is happening is that here you have your double cover of the Riemann sphere that I wrote here. So this is actually a double cover, a ramified double cover. And what happens is that we have opened the cat.
and then in the what sorry i said this completely wrong here what corresponds to this uh, picture is that this uh, the first copy of uh, cp1 will be outside and the second copy will be inside so okay um, this uh it's maybe a bit fast to get all the details but i hope uh, you get the idea so you get the very nice uh, spectral curve given by this uh, parameterization. So this is the explicit parameterization that I'm talking about here. It depends on this alpha and gamma that remember are some complicated series in the T's but that we can compute. And this is actually the first instance that we see in the mini course of a spectral curve. So the initial data of the topological recursion for maps is this one. I'm happy that you saw in the talks yesterday many other examples. Um, but okay, this one is a bit, uh, you're seeing a bit more the details. And actually you can find the uh, the explicit dependence on the Z for the disks. So this lemma allows us to actually compute the generating series of disks. And uh, then given the, given the UK um, precisely, it's not uh, super straightforward in general, but if you specify some uh, T's, then you can always get it. So. You can always characterize the, the UKs from the information that I gave you. And uh, what happens in general for a spectral curve is that around every ramification point, it looks like a square root, okay? That you can imagine from uh, the, the, the explicit things that you saw that it comes from that square root over there. Uh, so, okay, we have here a ramification point. And then we always have two points around the ramification point that go to the same Z coordinate. And we call the Galois conjugate of Z uh, sigma of Z. So let's do it explicitly in this case, because uh, for the moment we are really trying to understand the details of this case. So, okay, yeah, here we just uh, take our derivative and then the zeros are just, uh, sorry, what am I doing? So these are the only two ramification points for this uh, spectral curve. And then we can easily find the uh, Galois conjugates in this case. They are just one over Z. So, okay, if you put one over Z here, you will get the same in this case. And actually in this case, this uh, involution is global in the curve. Okay, but this is not always the case in topological recursion. So yeah, another little thing that you can observe is that uh, the ramification points are fixed points of these uh, conjugates. Wait, sorry. Okay, and then this will be important for the for the solution. So, okay, I hope you got uh, an idea of how the zero one case works and that uh, you feel confident that you could get all the details maybe with a bit of help of uh, an ask book. Um, but uh, I will continue because we want to try to solve the problem with topological recursion, but please uh, ask me questions. Uh, uh, it may have singularities, yes, yes. And those are important for, for some things, but uh, I will not uh, focus too much on that, but uh, it's important, for example, for the integrability part of the problem, this type of things. So now I will, are there more questions about the disks? Yes? Yes. Uh, 
Exactly, yes. Exactly. So in this case, in principle, you saw many details to be able to compute the, the spectral curve. And this is what happens in many, many cases in combinatorics and in matrix models. You can compute what happens for 0, 1, and 0, 2. That gives you the spectral curve, and it gives you a way to already start checking, because you can run the topological recursion, and you can see if your numbers match for higher topologies. That's uh, one very standard way of trying to prove uh, TR, trying to attack TR. What happens in other problems is that 0, 1 and 0, 2 may not make sense for the problem. So you don't have a way to compute them at, at the beginning. So you start from guessing the recursion. And if you see that uh, probably it's going to work, then you can extrapolate the 0, 1 and 0, 2 that you should get. But this is not how this is working here. I'm proving everything up to details. So you, you saw the computation of uh, 0, 1. Exactly, this is exactly what you said. Yes. Otherwise, that this could be some kind of an, an anatomic thing, and instead you're actually saying, no, because I can still have some kind of recursion on the lengths. Is that correct? And that yes, exactly. That so so if you want to do this uh, slowly, you would start by writing the recursion for the F for the f's with the lengths, keeping track of right. everything. And then you sum over lengths because you know that in reality you want to check what happens for the correlators. And uh, this is what you get. So I was a bit fast. I skipped the first step. But uh, exactly, yes. OK, thank you. OK, so cylinders. Cylinders is uh, one of the craziest things of topological recursion, I would say. So what happens is that uh, the case of cylinders gives you something universal, something that has very nice properties. And uh, yeah, I, I find it, uh, I still find it pretty crazy. So the generating series that you will get in the Zs is universal. So maybe I will uh, write it first before advertising more of this so you can see something concrete. You need to shift the cylinders by this thing that will not have a combinatorial meaning, actually. And then you will get this thing in the Zs that if you saw talks of topological recursion, you will have seen for sure. That is this universal object that I'm talking about. So this is very nice. Observe that for uh, disks, you get this uh, quite crazy thing that depends on the T. So computing it is not so, so easy in, in some particular cases. I'm telling you that it's possible and it's not uh, nothing complicated, but okay, you need to compute stuff. It depends on your very specific problems. This T will depend, this U will depend on your T's. Uh, for omega zero two, you need to know omega zero one because you have X's here. But in the Z, this always stays the shape for many, many, many types of maps and many problems in topological recursion. So it's very nice. So what I mean here, first of all, is that this is independent of the T case. OK, yeah, maybe I will uh, say just uh, one minute, a little thing about the nice thing that this gives us in combinatorics. So you see one, one of the powerful things of the topological recursion, because this is an old problem in combinatorics. So it has been solved. It has been enumerated in other ways before topological recursion. But still, topological recursion gives a lot of structure to the problem. So one nice thing is that this is telling us that this is a rational function. in the sets. And uh, this is considered very important in combinatorics. So there is a, so this is a pretty crazy thing that is algebraic in the X. And we find this kind of um, sense of variables that seems magical, but it actually has a very nice combinatorial interpretation. So these two series, you can interpret them in terms of something called mobiles that is uh, coming from a 
very well known bijection in combinatorics uh, between maps and these mobiles. Okay. Uh, so this tells us something about the decomposition of our maps into some elementary pieces. And what this is telling us is that we can build the disks out of these elementary pieces. So this is very nice from the combinatorial point of view. It happens for many problems it, and it tells us something about a very rich combinatorial structure. Now, the very nice thing of topological regression is that it will be direct that this very important property and not easy to prove for uh, higher topologies is actually very difficult combinatorially. It will happen directly from topological recursion for every topology. So this is uh, something that uh, really appeals a lot uh, combinatorialists. And uh, yeah, okay. So I will come back to cylinders now. So I was saying that this guy is a geometric object in our uh, Riemann surface. So it's actually called the fundamental differential of second type. And in this case, it's the simplest one because it's on the Riemann sphere. But yes, uh, just a very little uh, digression um, to what will happen in general. We remark. Yes. 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 Maybe. Okay. <laughs> yes. Thank you. That's uh, that's important. Um, so okay. In complex analysis, we have the Cauchy kernel. That, as you know, it's very nice because it has this uh, super nice property. That it gives you back the function if you take the residue against this kernel if your function is holomorphic. Unfortunately, this guy only exists in CP1. However, if we take, if we differentiate it, we get uh, the differentiation uh, Cauchy kernel, maybe it's called, I don't know if I'm inventing this. This gives you back the derivative of the function at the point. And the nice thing is that the, this is exactly what our fundamental differential does. And this exists for any Riemann surface. Okay, so this is a little digression of the general theory. Um, now I want to give you the beginning of the maybe not the end, unfortunately, but at least the beginning of the solution for stable topologies. So now you saw everything I managed to say in one hour about the unstable topologies. Sorry, there I really didn't prove anything. This you have to prove, of course, that this is uh, that you have this equality. And it's, uh, well, it takes a, a bit of work. But uh, yeah, I skipped that. So I said uh, stable topologies, or higher topologies okay so you may have guessed from there a little bit although i didn't emphasize it too much and i even had to be corrected about this so <laughs> the natural objects for us are differentials on our um riemann surface so actually we want to do that for any g and n and it will just be because these will be the guys with the very nice properties. So now I will uh, write it properly for every topology. So the natural guys will be called omega gn. It will be differentials on the on each variable. So it's like a one form in each variable if you want.
And it contains, of course, our combinatorial problem. Just multiply by uh, dx1, dxn. And then there are some little shifts for the unstable topologies. Okay, so the shift that I already told you for uh, cylinders, uh, also for disks, I already told you. Okay, yes, because the Y, yes, this I didn't write, but uh, omega zero one of Z is just uh, this Y that I wrote there, Y of Z times the X of Z in this case. Okay, so now from touch recursion, this is another little thing that you have to believe because I will not have time to justify. But from touch recursion, you can prove inductively the following properties that will help us get the topological recursion. So the omega GNs are symmetric, meromorphic differentials. They have the following skew symmetry property. So omega gn of z1 zn is equal to minus omega gn of uh, here we put our uh, involution. I sorry without the minus. Just you put the involution and you have to change the sign and you leave the other variables the same. So this is called in the general theory, the linear, linear loop equation. And then for all stable topologies, this will actually be meromorphic differentials with poles only at the, at the ramification points. Okay, so these things you can prove by induction from touch recursion. It's not too difficult for the map case, but in general, uh, these can be difficult things to prove as well. It's just that in this case, I, I take this for granted and then I give you the, the shape of the topological recursion from it. Okay, so here it starts our, our actual proof that we we'll follow from the loop equations. So we use just Cauchy formula. Now, we want to use that for every one form, the sum of residues is equal to zero in a compact Riemann surface. So this is a one form. So we can move our contour to surround all the other zeros of this uh, one form here, one form in Z1. So now we introduce this pole at z equal z1, but we also have the poles of this guy coming from the branch points that we get from the third property. So uh, this is what we do here. So we change the sign because uh, we are just using this equality. Now we want to use, yes, uh, sorry, we are. Oh, you started five minutes late. So, so five, five more minutes? Five minutes is perfect. Okay, thank you. Then I will uh, finish this computation. So now we just use that these guys are the same around the ramification points. So we can use this to write this as one half, and then we will put the other term 
that will be just changed by the by the involution. So, okay, what is the fastest way of writing this? Sorry, no, I should write it like this. Okay, now this will be the same term, but with uh, our involution. And we are just using this property. So we are allowed to do this. Okay, so these two guys give the same residue. So I'm just putting a half and summing them. So it gives us the same. And now we use uh, our skew symmetry property. So we can just write So we use that this guy is equal to this changing the sign. So this is the only thing that I'm doing. So it uses Q symmetry that is number two. And now we write this guy. As just the integral and this you can see from the explicit shape that I gave in the cylinder part of omega zero two uh, from one over z to z. So we write our thing here like that. So, okay, this already starts looking a little bit uh, like we can get a topological recursion because this is, will be part of the kernel, but now we have to do the big part of using here touch recursion. That's what we will do. We will plug here what we got from touch recursion and we will eliminate all the extra terms that should not appear in topological recursion because we know it's true. And uh, it, we will only have the topological recursion terms surviving. So, okay, I will do this uh, the next day and it will be maybe a nice way of starting the, the last lecture. You will, we will just have proved this and we will see a bit more of the general theory. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, So other questions from here or from the remote participants? Yes. Oh. <laughs> so again, um, try to first uh, say your name and then so everyone will know. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Nitin. Um, so uh, basically, like for this one cut lemma, is there some sort of like philosophical like reason why you get double poles, like double zeros for all of everything except for two ramification points? I mean, the reason that you get some gene of zero curve. I mean, it seems seems a little bit crazy because you have some kind of like very complicated, uh, some very generic potential, right? And then it just seems that when you take this thing, you just get double double zeros for most of the zeros. Yeah, to be honest, I don't know. I have the feeling that I should say yes, because this happens in many uh, cases, in many important cases. So somehow the simplest combinatorics that you get out of loop equations. So, so we wrote the loop equations and we are trying to solve them. And what happens very often is that the simplest uh, solution combinatorially has this property. And then there are other solutions that don't have this property that are also given by maps, but just more complicated things. So um, maybe, but uh, to be honest, I don't know. It's, uh, I always found it as, like, as a technical thing that you need to prove and that many people assumed uh, in uh, many cases just to get the, the, the nicest combinatorial problem that you get out of a matrix model. But um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe someone knows better. Gaetan wants to comment something? <laughs> Yeah. 
what you should think of is that when you turn on uh, Boltzmann wave for these internal phases that T3, et cetera, TD, uh, first think of that as formal parameters. And since you do everything the perturbation of the Gaussian, uh, then you should still have the same structure. So the one in front of the semicircle, the square root, should become maybe a formal series in the T's. Um, so we'd expect that to be true. And then the non-trivial fact, well, it's not too hard, but you have to prove, is that actually, well, this has finite ways of convergence in these variables. So this remains true for small enough but positive uh, ways. Um, so that's one intuitive way to say, oh, yeah, it should be true. Um, there's actually a combinatorial proof that is true in quite full generality uh, whenever the generating series of maps are well defined, so their coefficients are finite. Uh, and you do see the cut growing, growing, growing. It, it must be just one cut, but it's maybe less intuitive. It involves more bijective combinatorics. But it's true quite generally that in, uh, in combinatorial problems, not geometric problems, but combinatorial problems, uh, the spectral curve is genus zero. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah, but uh, you can find, for example, in uh, in uh, chapter four, maybe of uh, Bertrand's book, you can find the multi-cut solution of of the same loop equations, and it also counts. It counts some kind of nodal maps. So okay, you also have some kind of map interpretation. It's just uh, uglier things, and uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. More questions. <laughs> yeah, uh, Johannes Branal from Münster. So I have a question regarding this B sigma. So you you have written that it can be constructed analogously for complicated Riemann surface. Let's say, uh, if I remember correctly, you can do this by creating some Eisenstein series and so on. So is it always created that way that this residue? condition is fulfilled or or how can i imagine these more complicated bergman kernels um okay so i'm talking about the classical um fundamental differential of the second type and then it will always have that property so even in any genus you can construct an object mm -hmm. that is associated to your riemann surface and uh, that satisfies that nice property Okay, but, so that is the determining condition to, to cr uh, create Bergman kernels in, in higher genus, let's say. Um, I, I would say not. Maybe you can see it that way, but usually you just build this uh, nice object uh, in, in some other way, and then it will satisfy this property. I don't oh, know I if see. you really okay. build it to, to satisfy this property. Okay, thanks. But then mm -hmm. uh, in combinatorial, in topological recursion, there are other... Um, omega zero twos appearing with some shifts mm -hmm. uh, that I would say we still don't understand so well because they are not uh, this uh, fundamental differential of the Riemann surface. So, yeah. All right, thanks. You're welcome. Someone else? Uh, or remote participants? So if not, then thank you very much. You're welcome.